We're in the book of John tonight. And we're going to be looking at chapters 9 and 10. Chapters 9 and 10. And if you remember from our previous few studies here, as we've been going through and looking at what God is doing and what's going on here in the Gospel of John, we've been in this last section here that we're in now for a few weeks, and we've been talking about the different conflicts in the ministry of Christ and in the life of Christ. And remember, he had that period of, of time when he was presenting himself for consideration. He was presenting himself that the people would be able to see who he was and choose him to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But then we moved into in chapter 7, and it goes all the way through to chapter 12, this period of conflict. And there's these different things going on in his life. There are these different trials going on and these different arguments that are happening throughout this entire time regarding Jesus. And the first one was the conflict over Moses in chapter 7 and 8. And then in chapters 8, the rest of chapter 8 was the conflict over Abraham. And we looked at that last time. Now tonight we continue to go through. And if you remember that Moses was, if you remember, he represented the law. Moses represented the law, and they were conflicted about Jesus because of the law and their narrow view of what the law was and what they had turned the law into. Matter of fact, here in chapter 9, Jesus accuses, it's either 9 or 10, he says, your law, as if they had converted it and perverted the law so greatly that it wasn't even God's law anymore, it was their law. And so they had this this relationship with the law that was improper. And then we saw in the rest of chapter 8 from verse 13 on that they were arguing with Jesus about Abraham. Now, Abraham represented faith. And we were looking at this idea of faith, this idea of how we need to have faith. And now we are going to be looking at this conflict over Jesus' sonship, that Jesus is the son of God. And you'll notice in your, on the title of your outlines there, it says the conflict over the son of God. You see, the people were not waiting for God or God's son. Just like with the law, they had perverted the law to their specific view of the law, what helped them do what they wanted. How many of you do that with the law? Anybody of you do that with the law? Seriously, you guys don't do that? How many of you... Use the tax code to your advantage as much as humanly possible. How many of you use loopholes in the law sometimes to help you out with your business or to help you out, right? I mean, we all do this to a certain extent. We go as far as we possibly can without technically breaking the law, don't we? Don't anybody else try to do that besides me, right? I don't want to pay more in taxes than I absolutely have to, but I do pay my taxes. And I don't want to, uh, and, and a lot of times we, we have a tendency, well, if we think we can get away with 70 instead of 65, because they, they let the first five go, right? On the freeway, 65 miles an hour. Oh, yeah, but if you're going under 70, they won't give you a ticket. So you, you push that barrier as far as you possibly can. And the Jews were doing the same thing. They, they used the law to their advantage and their advantage only. Lawyers are good at this, aren't they? In one case, they will argue this way, and in a different case, they'll argue the exact opposite of what they just got through arguing in the first case, because it's a different client, and they want a different outcome. And it's really sad to see how people misuse the law. And then when we talk about faith and Abraham, how they were trying to say we were children of Abraham, and they were looking at the blood, the blood relationship with Abraham and not the faith relationship with Abraham. Now, as we talk about Jesus, from the time of Abraham on, God had told everyone that he was going to bless the entire world through Abraham's seed. Remember that? He said, through your seed, the whole world will be blessed. And if we go back further, when Adam and Eve were there, God told Adam and Eve, for the seed of the woman not the man, the seed of the woman is going to be bitten by the the snake and then he's going to crush the snake's head. Now what that prophecy means there in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, what he's referring to is that there was going to be 
a man born of a virgin, meaning only the seed of the woman, not including the man. That was the prophecy of the virgin birth of Christ, that the Christ would be stricken by the serpent and that he would crush or defeat. You see, if you, it, when the serpent bites the heel, it indicates number one, size, and it indicates mortality because if you get bitten by a, a, a very dangerous snake, what happens? You die, right? But yet, even in all of that, he was going to come out victorious by now what happens if you crush somebody's head? They're gone. They're done. That's the only way, you know, in, in Nicaragua, when we used to kill snakes, you can't just cut the head off. Do you know the head can still bite you even like half an hour later? You have to be careful. There's still venom there. People don't realize that. So when you get a coral snake or, or you get a, we had these terciopelos. That's the most dangerous snake that you can find in Nicaragua is a terciopelo. It's much, much more dangerous than a rattlesnake or anything like that. It's very dangerous. And when we would find one of those, you would start chopping at it with a machete until it stopped moving. And then you would go for the head and you would crush it with a shovel or a rock or, or whatever you could. You would crush the snake's head because you didn't want it coming back and biting anyone. Then you'd throw it in the trash or whatever. Now, this prophecy referred to the son of the woman only, not pertaining to the man, who is going to be struck by the, the serpent, and it would seem like a mortal blow, but in the end, he would overcome the serpent and, the, and that strike with his venom, and he would crush the serpent's head, which is the exact same thing that happened, right? Jesus came, born of a virgin, from, through Mary, not through Joseph. He was bitten, if you would, by the serpent. They crucified him. It looked like he was over. He was done with. He was already finished. The battle was over. And that three days later, he rose from the dead. He defeated death and he crushed the enemy. The, the job is already done. We have salvation because of it. Now, when you look at what God was trying to tell them, even from the moment the first sin occurred up until now, the message has always been that someone is going to have to suffer for sin. Matter of fact, I want to take your, your, your mo uh, moment and go back to that first sin. God creates Adam and Eve, and he puts them in the Garden of Eden, and he gives them everything that they were ever going to need, and he says, just don't eat of that tree. And what's the first thing that she does? I want to look at the tree. So she goes over there. We don't know where Adam is. He's doing whatever he's doing. And Eve is over there, and she's talking to the serpent at the tree, and the serpent convinces her that this is great, this is awesome, this is what you need to do, this is who you need to be. Your husband doesn't know what he's talking about. God doesn't know what he's talking about. You need this. And so she goes over there. She eats of the fruit. And she becomes naked. Wait, I thought she was already naked, Pastor. No, actually, before that, they were clothed in righteousness. There's a word in, in, in the Bible. It's called Shekinah, and it represents the glory of God. And Moses, when he met with God face to face, would shine with this glory. He, God's glory would just kind of rub off on him. Now imagine that, Moses walking down the hill and everybody knew where Moses was. It's like in Vegas, you know the Luxor, the big pyramid looking thing? Got the big light sticking out of the top of it. You know why they did that? So you always know where it is. You always know where the Luxor is in Vegas. Just look up, there's a light, go to that way. That's our hotel over there. Moses had that. Everywhere he went, everybody knew where he was. Talk about no privacy. Everybody knew where Moses was and what was he doing? Well, where was he at? Well, they know because there he is. Now imagine up until this moment, Adam and Eve had both been in the very presence face to face with God. They were shining brighter than Moses could have ever imagined. They were clothed in righteousness, the glory of God, the Shekinah of God. And the moment that she ate of that fruit, she became naked. That glory whoosh, disappeared. That Shekinah, gone. Now think about that for a minute. Because God later said, who told you you were naked? The whole point was that they were clothed in righteousness. Now at this moment, Adam comes and he finds his wife standing there and she's naked. And he says, what have you done? 
By the way, when the Bible talks about uncovering someone's nakedness and it being bad and it being terrible and how our nakedness is ugliness and all this other stuff, when the Bible talks about that, he's not referring to the fact that the human form is ugly in and of itself. He's not saying that women are ugly or men are ugly. He's not saying that the human form is ugly. What he's referring to is that the human form was never designed to be seen in that way. It was always designed to be seen with the Shekinah of God. The reason we wear clothing today, the reason that we are required to wear clothing today is to represent sin and the lack of the covering of God's righteousness over our bodies. It's because we live in sin that we wear clothing. Okay? And unclothing yourself just reveals what? Sin. Because you're not covered with the glory of God. This is a really interesting idea that you, when you talk about the, the fact that we have to remain clothed, it, God it, it is not ashamed of the way that he created the human form. It's just really sad of what we've done with it since he created us. Now, I... Adam sees his wife. She's not clothed anymore with the righteousness of God. And he goes and he says, what's going on? And she says, I ate. So here. And he has to make a choice. There his wife is standing. And remember, he knew what it meant to be lonely. He knew what it meant to be sad. He knew what it meant to not have anybody to, comparable to him. And he made a conscious choice. Matter of fact, Paul said it this way. For man was created first and then Eve, and man was not deceived but the woman being deceived ate of the fruit and gave it to her husband. It's very interesting what that means. You see, Eve was deceived by Satan. Eve really thought that in the end, she was going to be like God if she ate of the tree of the knowledge of fruit and of good and evil. But the reality was is that she became the furthest thing from God and the glory of God stopped covering her. Now, Adam comes over, sees what his wife has done, and he sees that he is going to lose her. He has a choice. I can tell God what she's done and she's going to die. Because the Bible says, in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So he had to make a choice. The problem was his human perspective. He, he wasn't thinking at this point. He was thinking with the, he was using his emotions and not logic. He still had a bunch of ribs left. Why did God use a rib from Adam instead of something else? I think it was because he was trying to show Adam, look, I can do a lot, but you need to choose me. Adam didn't choose God, however, he chose who? He consciously chose his wife. That's why the Bible says in the New Testament, through one man, sin entered the world. You see, Adam had the choice to not sin. Eve would have died. God could have done something else for Adam. We can't blame women for sin in the world because Romans says through one, through one man, man was guilty of sin. And it was because man sinned that sin was propagated to all mankind. It was through the man that sin was accounted to humankind. And it is through the inheritance of the man that sin passed down through every generation to every human being in the planet except for one. When Jesus was born, there was no man involved with his conception. Which means Jesus did not inherit the same sin nature that everyone else had. Jesus did not inherit sin. The Jews were not thinking about sin nature. The Jews were not thinking about defeating their lust or their pride or their arrogance. They were only thinking about getting rid of the Romans. And because they were so sidetracked with their own desires, they never really stopped to think about what was going to happen next. Now, going back to Genesis... Here's Adam and Eve. God gives them this, there in Genesis 3.15, he gives them this prophecy about the coming Messiah, and then he does something else. It says that God made them clothing of animal skins. Do you realize that the first thing to die in the entire universe was killed at God's hand? I want you to consider that for just a moment. The first living thing to ever die was killed at the hand of God. 
What was it? I believe it was a sheep. While the Bible is not very specific in that nature, we do find out that Cain and Abel were both very, very good workers. One worked with vegetables, Cain, for all you vegetarians out there. And one worked with who? Sheep. Now, why were they herding sheep? Why did the first two people to be born to mankind, why were they focused on sheep? Well, it says that Cain, he brought his vegetables and God did not receive them, but Abel brought his sheep and God received the sheep. Why? Because in that moment that Adam and Eve sinned, God took one of these sheep and God showed Adam Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So God kills this sheep so that Adam and Eve didn't have to die that day. Remember what God said? In the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. But they didn't die. Why not? Because God killed a sheep in their place that they wouldn't have to die. And from that moment going forward, mankind knew that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And then in the Old Testament, when we get to the books of Moses, when we get to Exodus, we find out that the lamb that takes away the sin of the people has to be pure and perfect, and it has all these requirements. And then by the time we get to Christ, we understand one thing. Someone had to die for the world. Someone had to die for mankind. This person had to step in. It couldn't just be an animal. It had to be a human being who was perfect, who matched all of the criteria from God, and who was able to raise from the dead on his own. Now, I want you to think about that. There was only one possible person in the world who met those qualifications. It had to be the son of God. God, who came down in earthly form, perfect in all of his ways, to willingly die for our sins that we would not go to hell, that none would perish if they believe in him, but they would have everlasting life. The Messiah was not just to be a human. He had to be fully God and fully man at the same time. We call that, by the way, the hypostatic union. Hypo, H-Y-P-O, static. Don't ask me to spell that. And union. Hypostatic union. And what that means is that Jesus was fully God, yet fully man at the same time. He wasn't God in heaven and then man when he was on earth and then God when he went back up into heaven. That's duality and that doesn't work because then he wouldn't have been able to raise from the dead. He wasn't just part God, part man. He wasn't half God, half man like Hercules. He was fully God and fully man at the same time. So he's not God's son in the sense of a human father and son. God didn't have a sexual relationship with Mary and, and together with her produce a son. No, he was conceived of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is the one that made her conceive. If you remember, uh, Luke one thirty five declares, the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And it was very specific. Now, Jesus is fully God and fully man, and this is so important. He lived a human life, but he did not possess us in nature, which is why he could die for us. Now, Jesus had to meet all of the requirements of a holy God before he could be an acceptable sacrifice for our sin. And since the fall of man, the only way to be made right with God has been what? The shedding of blood. So now, if if Jesus was merely a good man, as some people claim, then he had a sin nature and he wasn't perfect and his sacrifice wasn't enough to save us. Wouldn't work. And if he wasn't a real human being, he couldn't stand in our place and give a permanent replacement for that sacrifice that we needed. He had to be both fully God and fully man. Now this concept, the Jewish leaders at the time did not understand. Why? Here's here's one of the, the, the hard things about spiritual truths. The Bible says that truth in the spirit, spiritual things, which is technically just 
spiritual truths, you could say, can only be discerned how? Spiritually, mindedly. What does that mean? How many of you have ever freaked out? Anybody ever freak out? Okay. And when you freak out, you're using your human interpretation of the world around you and you have decided that there's no hope or that there's just impending doom or whatever it is that's causing you to freak out. You can't understand spiritual things when you're thinking with your human heart or your human mind. Now I want you to consider this for a moment. Consider this for a second. When you get fired from your job and you freak out, the only reason you're freaking out is because you're not taking into consideration how big God is or how strong God is or how faithful God is or what God has promised to you and your family and what God will do for you and your family. You're not considering any of that. You're just looking at your human perspective, this little tiny aspect of life that you can't get over. Remember when the prophet was laying down asleep and there's his servant, he goes out onto the wall we're surrounded. And he goes back down to the prophet, wake up, wake up, we're surrounded. And the prophet's like, oh my God, will you just open his eyes so he can see the truth? And he goes up there with the spiritual sight that he didn't have before. And Gehazi was his servant's name. Gehazi goes up to the wall and he looks out and he sees, yes, they are technically surrounded, but the people who are surrounding them were surrounded by God's armies. When you have a spiritual focus, you think differently. But you see, the leaders of Israel didn't have this spiritual focus. What did they have? They had a selfish, personal, human focus, and that means that they could not understand God's word properly. They couldn't understand prophecy properly. They didn't understand the word, the work, or the, the will of God at all. And this is sometimes my problem, and I am willing to bet it's probably your problem too. Even if you have a devotion every day and read God's word every day and you pray every day, if you rely on your own understanding to understand God's word, you will never get very far. Now, I want you to think about that for just a minute. How many people do you know that take God's word out of context to justify their sinful actions so that they can feel better about themselves, right? Lots of people do this all the time. You hear about these churches where they have a female pastor or a gay pastor or all of this other stuff. Now that's completely against God's word, but it doesn't matter to them because they say, well, this passage or this passage, they've gone through God's word systematically looking for proof that they can do whatever they want to do. How is it that they can read the same Bible that we do and they come up with vastly different ideas about what it says? Because when you don't read the Bible through the eyes of the Holy Spirit, you come up with only what you want to see. And if you want to try to justify drug abuse or, or being able to own slaves or being able to be a racist, or be, you could probably come up, you could twist some verse into meaning what you want it to mean, which, as you know through history, people have done, haven't they? But that's not God's heart. That's why the Bible says, lean not on your own understanding. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all of your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. The people of Israel were relying on their own understanding of God's word <coughs> rather than the Holy Spirit teaching them about God's word. <coughs> because of that, they weren't waiting for a Messiah. They were waiting for a general to come in here and defeat the armies of the Romans. And what they didn't understand is that if you just simply go back to Genesis 3.15, the Messiah who was coming wasn't just going to defeat the armies. He had to first suffer. And that was clear from the first moment of the first sin all the way forward. <coughs> so as we read these couple of chapters, I want you to keep that in mind. His conflict over the Son of God started because of a lack of understanding. And maybe you're in a, in a conflict with God. Maybe you're upset with God or you're anxious, you're frustrated or you don't like what God's doing or how your life is turning out or what's going on. And the only reason that could be possible is because you are looking at this situation that you're in through human eyes and, and a personal humanistic perspective. But when you take a step back and you look at things from God's perspective, everything changes. 
Now, it says here in verse 1 of chapter 9, now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth, and his disciples said to him, hey, rabbi, teacher, who sinned? Was it this guy, or was it his parents that he was born blind? Somebody messed up. Who was it? Now, I imagine that you're driving down the street, and you see a car that's all tore up. And you see that one of the wheels is kind of wobbling, and and it looks like it rolled over three or four times. And there's this little old lady driving down the road. And you think to yourself, okay, who was it? Was it this lady who rolled her car off a cliff or did somebody hit her? Or what happened to this lady's car? Was it she that sinned or somebody else that she would be in that kind of a condition? That's basically what they're saying. And Jesus is saying, no, no, it's not this guy's fault. It wasn't his parents' fault. We always look for someone to blame, don't we? Isn't that the case? Something goes wrong, you're always looking for someone to blame. And it seems like at work, that's always the problem. Something goes wrong, and everybody wants to blame someone. You get cancer, you're going to want to blame someone or something for your cancer. And in the world today, people, you know, I heard about this 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 Vegas shooting, you know that they're already bringing lawsuits against everybody. They're already starting to file lawsuits against Jason Aldean, the country singer singing on the stage of the, uh, against the hotel who owned the property where the, the Mandalay Bay owns the property where that concert was going on. And so they're bringing, MGM owns all of it. And so they're bringing lawsuits against MGM. And someone is even trying to sue the police department and the fire department for trying to help save lives because they didn't do it fast enough. And I'm thinking to myself, besides, you idiots, I'm sorry, I had to say it. Besides that, that was the first thing that ran through my mind. And as soon as I calmed that down, you know what I thought to myself? This is human nature. Someone dies, we want to blame somebody. Forget blaming the guy who pulled the trigger because he's dead. So now we got to find somebody else to blame. And they're going through and they're filing these lawsuits. And I'm thinking to myself, they were interviewing them on the radio. How do these people still practice law? Why do judges allow them in their courtrooms? How does this happen? But I was thinking about it a little bit more. And we're the same way. We're like these disciples. We always want to blame somebody for what's going on. Forget entropy. Forget that through one man sin entered the world through sin death and thus death is passed unto all men, guess what? If you get cancer, it's not just because you ate some kind of food or you lived under power lines or you were eating lead paint chips as a kid. It's because death is in the world because of sin. And whether it's cancer or a Mack truck or you fall off a cliff, you're going to die someday. Do you all understand this concept? You're all going to die, some of you sooner than others. Now, I am not advocating that you go out and you not take care of yourself. Wear your seatbelt, eat vegetables every once in a while, okay? But I, I talk to people all the time and they want to live forever. It's not going to happen. One of, my, one of my relatives by marriage used to tell me all the time, my father-in-law used to tell me, Leon, you're going to die young. I said, I really hope so. Now, as a hospice chaplain, I really hope so. And him and I used to argue. He was a vegan, vegetarian, no vaccines, anti-vaxxer, anti-everything, worked out all the time, weighed like 30 pounds. And he told me, you know, you're going to die young. I said, I hope so. I hope I'm like 45, 50. I'm going to have a heart attack. I'm going to be done. You, you're going to live to be 100. In the last 40 years, you're going to be in some nursing home. Nobody's going to come to visit you and some guy named Bubba changing your diapers. I don't want to live that long, just so you all know. Now, you might think I'm joking, but let me just tell you what the Bible says. Paul, I think, and I shared the same vision of life. To, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I don't want to outlive my usefulness to Christ. When Christ is done with me, I want to go home. I'm not going to prolong misery, and that's all that awaits you, by the way. Ask somebody who's older, and they'll tell you. All of you older guys, anybody over 40 is always telling the young guys who are in their 20s and 30s, just wait till you hit 35. Just wait till you hit 40 as you're hobbling around church, you know, and you're kind of, 
and you're grunting when you're sitting in the pew and you're uh, standing up and you tell these young kids you're running around, just wait till you're my age. <laughs> you're constantly telling people this. Now, who are you going to blame? You're going to blame the devil? You're going to blame your eating habits? I got to tell you, whether it comes in your 30s, your 40s, your 50s, it's going to happen because of entropy, because of sin. You're going to get sick. You're going to get hurt. You're going to break down. You're going to die. I said it. You're going to die. And there's this idea, especially among people who don't know Jesus right now, that are all about trying to prolong suffering. And right now, and by the way, I work as a hospice chaplain. I get to see everybody on their way out the door. That's my job. Every day I pray for people who are actively dying. And you know what they all have in common? They wish they would have died sooner. And yet when they get that stage four cancer diagnosis, and the doctor already knows there's nothing I can do for you. They try everything. They'll do chemo for six months to get two more months out of life. And guess what? They're going to be sick and no hair and their body is going to be completely broken down and terrible because of all that poison. But chemotherapy is just adding poison to your body. Hopefully we'll kill the cancer before we kill you. And then we'll nurse you back to health. That's what chemo is all about. All for a couple extra months of misery. My dad, I'll never forget it. When he got cancer, he's like, nope. Let me go. I don't want that. I don't need that. I want to go be, why would I prolong going to be with Jesus? Now, all of this to say that we always want to blame somebody. We always want to blame something. We always want to, oh, it's this person's fault, or it's the trans fat, or it's the, you know, soda, or it's whatever. And, and to an extent, we have to take care of ourselves, okay? I don't drink very much soda because, number one, I don't want diabetes. I don't. It steals the calcium out of your bloodstream. There's a lot of problems with soda. I, don't, I just don't like it, okay? But at the same time, I love steak. I'm not going to go through my whole life without bacon and steak just so that I can live an extra year or two in a nursing home. I don't want that. I don't want that. If I start to get, by the way, if I start to get to where I can't function anymore, send me to Iran with the shirt that says he's a Christian. Okay, put tracks in my pocket, whatever you got to do, they'll take care of the rest. <laughs> if Iran's not a problem at that time, you know, something happens to Iran and they nuke them or whatever happens, you know, then find another country that, that doesn't like Christians and send me there. There'll be plenty of them at the time, okay? Just send me there. I'll be a missionary for five seconds. And then I'll be with Jesus and I'll die a martyr and it'll be awesome. But think about it. These guys are, oh, somebody's fault. Somebody sinned. Somebody, and Jesus is like, guys, why don't you just understand that God wants to do something amazing? You know, you look at your trials, you want to blame somebody. Maybe I didn't do something right, or maybe this is going wrong. Why don't you just think that God wants to do something awesome in your life today? Why don't you just understand that God says, I want to use you for my glory today? So buckle up and get ready, because here we go. So Jesus said, neither this man nor his parents, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me. Now, I, look at verse 5. This is a, an interesting verse. It says, as long as I am in the world, the works... Now, now, notice he says, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Now, that caught my attention. I thought Jesus was the light of the world Always. But that's not what he says. And you'll hear a lot of people say, Jesus is the light of the world. But what did he say? He said, I'm only the light of the world. How long? As long as I'm here. So what, we're all walking in darkness? No, here's the cool thing. We are then called to be what? Salt and huh, light. Not that I am the light, I'm just a little reflector. You know the moon doesn't glow on its own, right? Maybe you don't. The moon does not glow on its own. The moon has no light source of its own. The sun emits light and it reflects off of the moon and that's what we're seeing at night, okay? And the reason why you don't always see the moon or you only see part of the moon is because the shadow of earth is being cast over the moon, okay? It's like an eclipse basically, essentially, for the moon. 
We are like the moon and God is the sun. Even though the sun's not visible directly, he reflects off of us into this dark world and we illuminate the world with Christ. You are called to reflect Jesus everywhere you go. He can't be seen by the world, but the world can be illuminated by him through you. The light is not your own. It is of him who sent you. And here's the coolest thing. The moon has craters and canyons and volcanoes and rocks and dry, bed, dry oceans and all that other stuff. But how many of you really notice that on a full moon? The brighter the moon is, the less detail of the moon you see. I used to have a telescope. I used to point it at the moon. And the best time and the best place to look at, a moon through a tel- at the moon through, the, through a telescope Don't look at the moon when it's a full moon. There's too much light. You can't see any detail. All you see is the light. You want to look at the moon through a telescope, wait till it's only about 30% lit and look at the ridge between the darkness and the light. And that's where you'll actually see the craters and the detail and everything else. The brighter Christ is in me, the less of me they see. The brighter Christ is in you, the less of your flaws and your details they'll see and the more of Jesus they'll see. Isn't that awesome? Yes, you're flawed. We get it. We know. But the more of Jesus you have, the less of those details people will notice. That is amazing. God called us to be the light in this dark world. But he says while he was there, he was going to be the light, and then it was going to transfer to us. We were the reflectors. So when he had said these things, he spat on the ground, and he made clay with the saliva. This is getting really up close and personal. Hey, blind guy. Clay with spit in his eyes, okay? Not sanitary, except for he's Jesus and he's amazing. And so he goes to the man and he, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with clay and he said to him, go and wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated, sent. So he went and he washed and he came back seeing. Now, pause there for just a minute. Jesus didn't just give him sight. There was a movie a, a few years back, it was probably a couple decades back, but it was about a a guy receiving his sight artificially for the first time. They did some surgery and he got his sight. But the thing was, he didn't just get his sight. The first time he was able to see something, it freaked him out. And, And the whole movie was about this man not being able to adapt to sight. Because just because you can see doesn't mean you know what anything is. Have you thought about this? God opens your eyes for the first time unless he gives you the ability to understand and discern what you're looking at. Imagine somebody getting their hearing back for the fir- getting hearing for the first time ever. Have they learned a language? Do they understand what they're hearing? No. So it's the same thing with sight. Just because the guy could see, how does he know what's a dog and what's a person and what's a tree and what's anything else? This guy's not been able to see anything since birth, but he goes to the pool of Siloam and he comes back what? Seeing, and not just seeing, but interpreting what he is seeing and understanding what it is. God didn't just give him the ability to see, but the ability to use sight, and that's amazing. God doesn't just leave you hanging. He doesn't give you a car and not teach you how to drive it, or he doesn't give you this, this gift and, not, and just leave you hanging. You'll go figure it out on your own. No, he gives us gifts and he gives us his word and he teaches us how to use them and he walks us through it. Imagine giving your kid a bike and not ever teaching him how to ride it. It's never gonna get used. God doesn't just give this person sight. He gives him the ability to use his sight. And so the guy comes back seeing. Therefore, the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind, I mean, It's not like the guy was there for two days and all of a sudden he, no, they knew him since he was birthed. They knew, that's John. John was blind before. John, can you see me? Yeah, I can see you. How many fingers am I holding up? What's a finger? No, he knew three. And so they're there and they're they're freaking out. And so someone said, this is he. Others said, oh, oh, he's like him. And maybe it's his body double or something. No. So they said to him, how are your eyes opened? We got to know. And he said, a man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. 
So I went and washed and I received sight. And so they said to them, well, where is he? I don't know, I was blind when I left. I didn't see which way he went. He really didn't. He was blind until he went to the pool. And so there they are. Now, I want you to write on this first line of your outline. This is really important. As we're talking about who the Son of God is, it starts with the power of the Son of God. Write that on that first line. The power of the Son of God. And the first thing that we see about the power of Jesus, the Son of God, is this power of illumination. And he uses the restoration of this man's sight to teach us about the power of the light of Christ. You see, we are all like this blind man. And we were born darkened in our sight. We couldn't see anything spiritually. We couldn't understand anything spiritually. And these people who were trying to lead Israel were just as blind as the rest of the Israelites. Spiritually, they were just as blind as this blind man. And so when they read the Bible, they were blind. And when they prayed, they were blind. And when they worshiped, they were blind. They had no possible way of understanding sight. Explain to a blind person the color blue. That's like trying to tell a non-Christian about the things of the spirit. Spiritual things must be discerned. Spiritually, color must be discerned by those who have sight. Hearing has to be discerned by those who can hear. If you try to explain hearing to a deaf person or, or colors to a blind person, it's never gonna work. They will never understand. They have to retain the ability to perceive those things first in order to understand them. And that's what God is talking about when he says spiritual things must be discerned spiritually. You cannot live your entire life in darkness and expect that you understand God's word. That's why non-Christians have no business trying to discern God's word. They will never understand it. They will never get it. I'm not saying they shouldn't read it, but when you have these non-Christians trying to tell Christians what God's word says, nah, you don't understand it. You don't get it. Nor could you, because you're blind, you're deaf. How could you understand sight? How could you understand hearing? But when Christ comes in, when Christ enters your life, he supernaturally gives you what? He restores that sight. He gives you the ability to understand his word. When I came to Jesus, I didn't know a whole lot about him, but I knew enough that I needed him. And that was it. And from there, guess what? He opened my heart to understand it. If you have a difficult time understanding God's word, then pray to God and ask him, God, give me understanding. Illuminate my life that I would understand and spiritually see. So Jesus comes that we could be illuminated and that we would illuminate others, the light of the world. But second, in verse 13, all the way down to really verse 19, we see that Jesus is a stumbling block for unbelievers. This power of Christ becomes a stumbling block to those who don't understand. These Pharisees and Sadducees and all these evil people, they brought this formerly blind guy to the Pharisees. Did he go there on his own? No. Was he showing off? No. Did he want the attention? No. He was taken to them. So he goes there. Now it was the Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Uh Uh-oh. Jesus and the Sabbath are really kind of cool. It was, it was his nonviolent protest, okay? He would just do everything on the Sabbath and drove people nuts. So the Pharisees asked him again. It says they asked him again how he had received his sight. So it was Pharisees who first found the guy. It was Pharisees in verse 10, 11, and 12 who were talking to the man because it says they asked him what? Again, so now it's the Pharisees again in in front of everybody. And he said to them, well, we put clay on my eyes and I washed. And I see he made clay. That's their problem. Jesus manufactured something on the Sabbath. He spit in the dirt and rubbed it in the guy's eyes. I don't call that manufacturing personally. Jesus didn't have like a clay pot business and he took some of his clay and rubbed it in the guy's eyes. I don't see the problem here, but they did. And so some of the Pharisees said, this man is not of God because he does not keep the Sabbath. Wait a minute. Did you just walk past the entire thing that the guy can see now? We took a blind guy who had no sight. We gave him sight and the interpretation of sight. And you're focused on somebody made clay on the Sabbath? Seriously? That's all you can see? Talk about missing the forest for the trees. 
These guys couldn't understand the situation. They couldn't understand God's word. They were focused on the law as a way, as an end to a means, or a means to an end, I should say. The law was their way to control the people. Jesus was not submitting to them. He was out of line. That's why Jesus later said, the man wasn't made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was made for man. And I'm God, so I can go over Sabbath. It doesn't matter. So here they're all stumbled. Oh, I'm so stumbled. You know, that's a funny word. A lot of times there are Christians out there who say, that really stumbles me. And the Bible says, if your brother offends you, go to him. But let me just add, don't be so easily offended. There are some people out there who get so offended over everything. You drive a Toyota Camry, that stumbles me, Pastor. You, you ate a Carl's Jr. famous star, that stumbles me. I'm not joking. There was a time where I would not eat a Carl's Jr. at all because of their stupid ads. Okay? But guess what? The CEO of Carl's Jr. got up and said, we're not going to run those kind of ads anymore. We have found out that, number one, they're too costly to produce, and they're not very effective. I can ask famous stars again. It's awesome. I won. Not me, God. Just like Chick-fil-A. I love Chick-fil-A. They have a good product, but you know what I like the best about them? They're closed on Sundays. They're Christians. They have Christian music playing all the time. I love Chick-fil-A, and I like to go to Chick-fil-A. Because I want God to win. I mean, it's that simple. So I I find it kind of interesting that these guys are just so focused on the wrong things. Oh, they're so irritated. And some Christians, they get so stumbled over everything. And it's little stuff. Just in the course of this teaching, I have used two words that might have stumbled you. Idiot and stupid. I said, I did. Don't be so easily stumbled. Jesus whipped people with whips, called people Satan. Okay, I think I'm all right so far. You want me to be more like Jesus? Okay, let me go. No, I'm, I don't know why they have this thing in the pulpit. But it reminds me of a whip. Think about it. So many people can get so easily offended. And it's really because we become so polarized. Take it easy. Take it easy. You can't stand people worshiping God by raising their hands? Then sit in the front and you don't have to look at it. You can't stand people not raising their hands? Sit in the front. You don't have to look at it. You can't stand the way that that person sings? Sit in the front. There's no one here. You don't have to hear them. You know, I had people, Pastor, I'm really stumbled that church starts at 9 a.m., Get over it. Get up early and come to church. I mean, there's really nothing else to do here. Sorry. Be stumbled, I guess. Some it's a stumbling block. And so the Pharisees, they're, they're getting caught up on something ridiculous that they don't even see the truth. Others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such things? No one else has ever had their sight returned to them, ever, and you're saying that the guy's messed up? And so... There's a division among them, and they say to the blind man again, so what do you say about this guy that opened up your eyes? What do you think about him? And, and he said, well, he's got to be at least a prophet. I mean, come on. So the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind, and yet, so now it's denying the one who was healed. If you can't beat the issue at hand, well, then attack the person, right? So and that, you weren't even blind, were you? This is all a ruse. This is just all something you're making up. So they called his parents in. Is this your son who you say was born blind? And uh, Then how does he see? Now his parents were probably well established in the community. And so I find this interesting. His parents, they stumbled on the stumbling block of Christ. Well, yeah, it's our son. And he was born blind. By what means he now sees, we don't know. Now, don't you think the kid went home and told his parents about everything? So why are they saying they don't know? He told them. He's of age, ask him. He will speak of himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed that he was the Christ, 
he would be put out of the synagogue. Now, the Jews know the problem. Here's the awesome thing. The Jews know that Jesus is the Christ. They just don't want anybody to say it. It's like per- pretending there's not a tarantula on your pillow. I'm just going to turn the other way. Nobody better say anything about it. Seriously? Get rid of the tarantula. Well, there's really nothing wrong. As he bites you and blood's dripping down your face. It doesn't work that way. So here they are, and they're trying to pretend that Jesus isn't real, that Jesus really isn't the Christ. They knew the answer, and they're trying to put on this this show and everything else, and even this man's parents, who would have, how many of you parents would be happy that your kid received sight? I would. How many of you parents would thank the doctor or thank the person who gave him back his sight? These parents are thrown into the states that this guy isn't real. They're siding with these incredulous, evil Pharisees rather than the man who restored their son's sight. They're choosing the world over Christ because they're afraid of losing something. I don't want to be kicked out of my club. And that's all it was to them. The synagogue was just a club. It wasn't a church. It wasn't a place of worshiping the Lord Most High. It was just a little club and they didn't want to lose their status. And so they didn't want to turn. Now, it's interesting. Ask him. Verse 24, so they called again. Now, what was a stumbling block to the evil became a boldness to the righteous. What does it say? So they called the man again. And this guy is like, can I go to the forest or the ocean or something? I want to go look at something. Why do I got to be here? Here he is. They called him again. And they said, give God the glory. We know that this man is a sinner. You got to glorify God. Something else happened. It was an angel. It was something. Glorify God. There wasn't this Jesus guy. He's a sinner. And so he answered and he said, well, whether Jesus is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I know, I was blind. Now I can see. And they said to him again, well, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? Did he give you medicine? Did he, and, and the fellow reviled I'm sorry, and he answered them, I told you already and you did not listen. Why do, you, why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? I love that. He's like, hey, you guys want to know where he is or something? Or what's going on here? I mean, come on. And now they reviled him and said, you are, you are his disciple. Well, you follow him, but we're Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we don't know where he's from. These are the same people he said, but isn't he Joseph's son from... They knew where he was from. And so the man answered, said to them, why is this a marvelous thing that you do not know where he is from? Yet he has opened my eyes. Now we know that God does not hear sinners, but anyone who is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. Since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Yet they answered, said to him, you are completely born in sin and you are teaching us. And they excommunicated him. (laughs) <laughs> Here's the funny thing. They were all born in sin. See, remember the thing that the disciples asked Jesus at the beginning, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? These people are saying, it wasn't your parents' fault. You're the problem. This is why you were born this way. And the guy's saying, Jesus saved me. You're the blind ones. You're the ones who don't understand. And I love this. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, that they excommunicated him. This guy was never going to be allowed back in the synagogue again. And let me tell you, he was all the better for it. If you're holding on to some club or some human recognition rather than following Jesus, you're going to lose. Who cares? Leave all that behind. Follow Jesus. And when you do, that's salvation to the lost. Notice that this power of Jesus is not just boldness to the righteous, but it's salvation to the lost. It says here, and Jesus heard that they cast him out, so he found him. He said, do you believe in the Son of God? And he says, hey, just show him, show me who he is, and I'll believe in him. And Jesus said to him, you have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Now, notice what Jesus says, for judgment I have come into the world that those who do not see me, that do not see may see, and those who may see may be blind. Now, then some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words. So apparently this guy was excommunicated, And some of the Pharisees, remember, they were torn. They kind of went with the blind guy to kind of talk to him a little bit more. So they're standing there, and he says, are we blind too? 
And Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no sin. <laughs> Remember, they were equating earlier blindness to sin. They were saying because he was blind, he was in sin. And Jesus said, if you recognized how blind you were, you would come to me to be healed. If you recognized your spiritual depravity. You see, the Bible says, blessed is he who... What does it say? You guys remember? Blessed is a poor in spirit. Blessed is he who mourns. What does that mean? You recognize your sin, right? These guys didn't recognize their personal sin. Therefore, they could never be forgiven of sin because unless you acknowledge that you're a sinner. This is one of the problems I have with evangelism, by the way. Sometimes people go out there and they evangelize and say, just receive Jesus. Everything's going to be better. That's not true. Don't receive Jesus just because you want a better life. You don't receive Jesus so you can be rich. You don't receive Jesus so you can be wise. You don't receive Jesus so you can be healthy. You receive Jesus because you're a dirtbag, evil sinner who deserves to go to hell. And the only reason you receive Jesus is because you recognize that and you don't want to be that person any longer. That's why we receive Jesus. You cannot effectively share the gospel without first explaining sin. Anyone who evangelizes without bringing up sin is doing it wrong. So Jesus tells these guys, you're blind because you don't recognize sin. And you know what the outcome is of sharing the gospel without talking about sin? People continue in sin. They may come to church for a little while and then they fail and they never get, get anywhere in life because they've not dealt with what? With sin. And unless you deal with your sin, you'll never grow in Christ. Jesus says the reason you're, you're going, that you're, you're in sin is because you don't recognize how blind you really are. So some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and they said to him, are we blind also? He said, if you were blind, you'd have no sin. But now you say, we see, therefore your sin remains because you don't want to admit your guilt. You're never asking for repentance. You're not moving on. So Jesus, the son of God, he, he has power to forgive. He has power to change, power to give you sight. In chapter 10, we see two things. I'm going to give them both to you right now. The, the second line of your outline, write the heart of the son of God. And on the third line of your outline, write the position of the son of God. In, in chapter 10, the first 21 verses, Jesus is talking about being the shepherd. And you've probably read this before. I encourage you to go back and read it again. And he says, I, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as the thief and the robber. Now, it could be said that the chief priest and anybody who was a Levite and a priest had entered into the service of God through regular biblical channels, if you would, okay? God had designated them to be a servant. The Pharisees were a political party who were trying to control Israel from outside of God's commandment. He's talking about the Pharisees. I want to be very clear. God is talking about the Pharisees. This is a problem in a lot of churches, by the way. You'll have the pastor who is ordained by God. You have the elders and leaders who, is or, who are ordained by God. And then you have people from outside of the godly channels that are trying to control the church from the side. And God says, nope, it's not what I have. It's not what I want. It doesn't work that way. So I, by the way, we don't vote in this church. If, you, if you've been waiting for a board meeting to, so you could have a voice and vote, it's never going to happen. Okay? We don't need to all get together to vote on if we're going to pay the electric bill. We get the electric bill, we see how much it is, we cry, and we pay it. And, and that's really the way it works. No vote necessary. Okay? We just take care of business because God is the one who's set this stuff up. And you know, it's interesting that Jesus is saying, listen, you guys can't follow the Pharisees. Why? Because the Pharisees, they're not ordained by God. They weren't chosen by God. They didn't come in through the door. They climbed in through a window. And they're trying to take over the house, but they're thieves and they're robbers. And he said to them again in verse 7, that I am the door of the sheep. You know, it's interesting. There's my favorite book that's not the Bible, but a secular book, if you would, is Pilgrim's Progress. And in that book, it's all about going through the door. The door is Jesus. You can't get to heaven by good works. You can't get to heaven because you know biblical prophecy. You can't get to heaven because your wife or your husband or your parents or your kids are Christians. You have to go through Jesus. He said, I am the way. I am the truth. 
I am the life. No one comes to the Father except for through me. You can't get there through the Pharisees or the Rotary Club. You can't get there through Calvary Chapel. You can't get there through Pastor Leon. You can only get to Jesus if you have a personal relationship with him. And then through Jesus, guess where you get to go? To heaven. To, to the Father. The heart of the Son of God is to save. And it's to be a good shepherd, as he says in verse 11. And, and notice in verse 13, the hireling flees because he's a hireling. I am the good shepherd in verse 14, and I know my sheep. See, Jesus is personal. Jesus is there. And he wants to have a personal relationship. And that's his heart. Jesus came that you can have a personal relationship with God. Not through some priest, not through some pastor, not through some denomination, not three times removed. Jesus wants you to have a personal relationship with him. The Pharisees wanted you to have a relationship with them and they would tell you what to do and they would pretend like they knew what God wanted. No. Jesus wants you to have a personal relationship with God. And then finally, the position of the Son of God in verses 23 22 through 42. And it was the feast of the dedication of Jerusalem and it was winter, so around November, December, January time. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch and the, Jeru the, the Jews surrounded him. How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. <laughs> you guys don't get it. I told you and you don't believe. So isn't that basically saying yes? I told you already, and you didn't believe. So, yeah. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me, but you do not believe because you are not of my sheep, as I said to you. My sheep hear my voice. It's interesting. Jesus acknowledges that he is the Son of God. Remember when he talked to the blind man, he called himself the Son of God. Here again, I'm doing my Father's work. I am the Son of God. He, in verse 30, I and my Father are one. And they wanted to stone him again. And Jesus said, many good works have I shown you from my father. For which of those are you going to stone me? <laughs> and they said, blasphemy. In verse 34, Jesus answered them, is it not written in whose law? Is it your law? The one that you guys are always saying is yours and yours alone and all this other stuff. And I love that. God called you gods, and if he calls you gods, then to whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent to the world, you are blaspheming because he said, I am the son of God? Now, this is interesting. He's playing semantics with them, and it's really funny because they don't know what to say. He kind of hit them between the eyes. Is, God, is he saying that we're all gods, like the Mormons believe that you're all going to be the god of your own planet if you're really good? That's really what they believe, by the way. It's really ridiculous. They believe that you, if you are a good Mormon... The reason you're supposed to have a whole lot of kids and a whole lot of wives as a Mormon is so that you can populate an entire planet by yourself. You're the next Adam and Eve. I don't want that kind of responsibility. Is that what he's saying? No. But to these, he, he gave the opportunity or the chance to become children of God. God made us in his own image. And he says, I want you to be my children. I, we, you know, we, we get to be sons and daughters of God too if we believe in Jesus. Isn't that awesome? So they saw again to seize him, but he escaped out of their hand. He went away. So he went beyond the Jordan, the place where John was baptizing at first, and there he stayed. And they came and they said, John performed no sign, but those things that John spoke about, this man were true, and many believed. So he did these signs. John, he just did nothing, and they believed. Now Jesus is there, and he has the signs, and they believed all the more. And that's really awesome how he, John planted the seed, Jesus was able to reap the fruit, the harvest. In this, we see that the Son of God came in power to save the lost. He came with the heart to have a relationship with you because he, was going, he is the Son of God. He was going back to the Father and he wanted to take us with him. Isn't that awesome? And with that, let me challenge you with something. Don't try to understand your life or God's word or everybody else's life or the news through your own human perspective. But get some spiritual goggles on. Get some Christ goggles on and start looking at life through the, through the lens of Jesus. 
And maybe you're blind or you're hurt or you have cancer or you got fired or you have 12 kids and you don't know how to feed them. And maybe God did that to you because he wants to do something in you and through you. Or maybe God is just ready to take you home. Whatever the issue is, look at life through the goggles of Christ and see what he's doing for you. And watch as he does something amazing in you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time in your word and we pray that as we would continue to worship you, Lord, that we would not be personally conflicted over the Son, but that we would recognize who Jesus is. Lord, that we would recognize that we need Christ for the remission of sins, that we would be saved from eternal damnation. And as we come before you today, we thank you for the provision of your Son. We thank you that he has the power to overcome sin. We thank you that you have chosen us to reflect the light of Christ in this world. And we pray that we would shine brightly for him today. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you and have a wonderful evening.